I think we're good to go. Good evening, BVI. At this point, we've got to say good evening, world. It's a, it's a wonderful day here in the British Virgin Islands. Things might seem a little bit low. Uh, most of us who live here understand the challenges. But we here in the BVI always see uh, the other side of the coin. And so today, I am very proudly representing the Rotary Club of Tortola here in the BVI, where we wanted to create a narrative for you, for me, for all of the BVI landers, and as far as my voice will carry about this deadly disease that the world is facing, uh, COVID-19. Unfortunately for us, because we are a very, very small territory, it feels terrible. We all know someone who has been afflicted by this terrible disease. We know, unfortunately now, someone who has died. I think as of today, we have 23 deaths. If I'm incorrect, I'm sure somebody will uh, update me with the statistics. And we want to have a dialogue. What makes this day different to all of the days? We're gonna have a conversation with the doctors and we're going to have a conversation with the citizens of the BVI. Today, we're not gonna have a debate. We're gonna have a conversation. We're going to be respectful of everyone's views. And I wanna get a little bit of housekeeping um, today because I think this is the first time in the history of the BVI, given the magnitude of this topic, we have every telecoms provider in the BVI here and running this show live. So I want to say a huge thank you to Flow. I'm going to put my fingers up so I don't forget any. To Flow, to Digicel, to 284 Media, to JTV Live, to ZBVI, and I think Z King. We are honored that you trust in our voice to tell a story worthy for the entire BVI to hear. And obviously by way of social media, the world. So these gentlemen, I'm the only female here today, but I can handle it, I promise you, are gonna make us proud. And I wanna introduce them. I'm not sure how my viewers are seeing them, but I'm going to introduce them based on how I can see them on my screen. So first of all, someone from the, the, um, the territory, one of the citizens of the BVI. I had the opportunity to speak to this young man very briefly, and I was floored by his super intelligence, Mr. Camroy Peters. Mr. Camroy Peters has given me permission to say that he is on this live and having this conversation as a skeptic. He has not yet um, bought in to the premise. And we would want to hear from him exactly what is the issue. And hear his side of the story because he, like many, many, many others in the BVI, share his concerns. And based on what I'm saying, he does have some better concerns and perhaps, perhaps the doctors can bring some levity to uh, some of the concerns that he has. Mr. Ian Cumming, Mr. Ian Cumming, I just met him today for the first time, but he has been here in the BVI before. He is uh, the first appointed UK ambassador for health to the overseas territory and a professor of global healthcare at Keele University. He comes with a vast array of expertise and no time better than now to have him here in the territory to assist us to get out of this um, very stressful time in the BVI. My next guest, everybody knows him, uh, Mr. Dr. Heskett Vanterpool. Dr. Vanterpool specializes in a cardiology, internal medicine and gas Astroenterology. I hope I got that right. He is the owner of Eureka, the owner of Bogan Villa. Everybody, the children, he probably delivered some babies too, I'm sure. Everybody knows Dr. Heskett Pantapool, so I'm so happy to have you along with Mr. Cummings. Next, uh, the doctor with the biggest smile in the world. Dr. Mitchell E. Penn. We're so happy to have him here as well. He is a general practitioner loved by all, loved, loved by all. And so we're very happy that he has been able to take some time out of his very busy schedule to have that conversation. I had the pleasure of going to his clinic a few days ago. He was mobbed with people 
and the service was exceptional. Given the situation, he still managed to give us that million dollar smile. Thank you so much, Dr. Penn. Mr. Andy Antonio Jeffers, I wanna call him a newly converted. So Mr. Andy Jeffers is one of our citizens in the BBI and he will give us his story. And I had a, I, I know Andy previously in our private lifestyle. And of course he's young, healthy, and why would I take the vaccine? But Mr. Andy Jeffers will tell us his story on just stumbling onto the vaccine, taking a vaccine, and in his mind, saving his life. He has uh, been diagnosed with COVID. He made it very public, and he will give us that story how he felt the vaccine helped him. And by Kedrick, we know a gynecologist. Uh, owner of Pig Smith, again, known by everyone here in the BBI, and certainly for sure the Caribbean. Uh, and he has been perhaps the most vocal, in my opinion, uh, in terms of doctors about the vaccine. So we know where he stands. He is certainly a proponent of the vaccine. I know he's very, very passionate in how he feels. But again, we are going to have this conversation and have uh, the ability to respect everyone's opinion. And so we're going to go right ahead. And of course, audience, thank you. And of course, I said thank you to all of the telecoms. You are able to ask questions later on. So get your questions going. We'll get to the questions as much as we can. But let's start this conversation. As of today, we have had 23 deaths. Uh, I think most of us, all of us really um, can say that we here in the BVI were living pretty comfortable. There was not the stress or the strain for those of you who actually uh, had the ability or the need to travel abroad for the last 15 months. We haven't felt that until recently, until I don't know, and one of the doctors can correct me, if the uh, confirmation came that the Delta strain is here, but something happened, something turned around and we are at this point. It is unfortunate that we do not have a high percentage of vaccinated residents, says the doctor. So the argument is, had we been vaccinated, we would never have so many deaths. I want to throw that very heavy topic right out. What evidence, and I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Cummings, since he is in that section. What evidence do we have that the BVI would have been in a better position in terms of managing the deaths, in terms of managing the extreme sickness, in terms of literally having folks as I understand, on a waiting list to get in the hospital, had the population had more vaccines? Do we have any strong evidence of that? Well, perhaps I could give a, a practical experience from Gibraltar, but before I do, can I start by passing on my sincere condolences to the families of everybody who's, who's lost their lives? This is a terrible, terrible virus that just causes devastation in populations, and anything that we can do to save a life or to prevent people from becoming ill, we should be we should be absolutely trying to do. So I was last here in BVI six weeks ago when clearly the, the position was was very different. And my view at the time was that the perception of risk associated with COVID, the disease, was low amongst the population. And the perception of risk associated with the vaccine was high. So people were more concerned about the vaccine than they were about the disease. Now, I worked in Gibraltar in the early part of this year. Tragically, we started vaccinating just at the time that the virus started to run through the community in a way not dissimilar to that being seen here at the moment. And tragically, Gibraltar saw somewhere in a six week period in January and early February this year. That was all to do with people socializing over Christmas, with the virus being brought in from other countries, with family meets, families meeting indoors. We started the vaccination program then, and because people could see, literally see the death and devastation that it was causing in that community, people were very quick to come forward to be vaccinated. And we're now in the position where 92% of the adult population of Gibraltar have been vaccinated, have had two doses of the vaccine. Now, the situation in Gibraltar has transformed. First of all, the number of cases that we're seeing is very small. We are still seeing cases in vaccinated people because we have never said 
that the vaccine prevents people from contracting the virus. But what we are seeing in people that have been vaccinated is minor disease. We're not seeing serious illness in the vast majority of cases. In people that haven't been vaccinated, a recent example, an 18-year-old who spent three weeks in hospital in Gibraltar was not to be vaccinated. So we can actually see practically what's happening in the difference between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated population. Thank you so much, Ian, for that clear um, description. Now, this show is for the ordinary person on the street, and we want to make sure we speak in a level where they can understand and actually um, interpret it. And I thought you did a great job. But let me just get to the tough questions. We, we have the evidence based on what Ian is saying and based on what the doctors are saying, based on what the government is saying, that the vaccine saves lives. But what happened, doctors, I'm gonna ask any of you to jump in on this. I never heard a narrative six, six months ago, 12 months ago, that the disease literally affects most people with pre-existing conditions. Now, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse. I literally have the most respect for persons in that industry. But the BVI has one of the highest rates of diabetes in the entire Caribbean. We put sugar in soup, in rice, in drinks. We put sugar in every single thing. And so that contributes to the deteriorating of our immune system. When the narrative shift, why did the narrative have to take this long to say, let's live a healthier lifestyle to avoid these things. For persons like Cam Roy now, we have to try to convince, and based on how Cam Roy looks, he looks like he can lift me up and I'm a big girl. But how, how would you get that narrative now when it's almost too late? Any of the doctors could, could, could help me up with that. Right. Um. When you ask anyone, you you know, all of us stay quiet. If you ask one person, then we are, you're likely to cause that person to speak up. We, I thought that we were telling people all along that the elderly pre diabetes, heart failure, cancer, kidney disease, etc., cetera, um, were at higher risk if they caught the disease. They're not at higher risk of catching the disease, I mean, of getting the infection, because all of us are breathing in the air and we can kill the virus. Mm -hmm. But when the virus enters our system and begin to set up and multiply, create an infection, those people with pre-existing conditions are at higher risk of getting serious illness and death. And persons who are looking very strong and healthy can also get very sick from this. So don't let's not focus purely on pre-existing conditions. A lot of young people have actually caught the disease. They may be looking fit, they may be very athletic, but when they come down with the disease, they can just as well, although less likely, um, get very sick, end up in hospital and possibly die. I heard a narrative about getting fit, but I feel like it's ramped up now more so. I want to accuse us of being more reactive and not proactive. And so that's just my opinion. Just so you know, I'm not speaking for anyone in terms of that. But we're here. We are here. And the matter of fact is, is this. Even with all the deaths and even with all the sicknesses, persons still are very skeptical of the vaccine. And so with that statement, I'm going to ask Mr. Peters to give us a very brief synopsis of what his concerns are, because I know that he speaks for a very large percentage of the younger people here in the territory and perhaps even the world. Thank you. Um, so... When it comes to the COVID vaccine, um, now, I've, from the start of everything, I've observed um, a lot of what happens. And me, myself, I try to keep myself abreast with what's going on worldwide, as well as what's happening in the local community. Uh, so when I saw it happening, I was like, okay, cool. Um, 
uh, we need to obviously, you know, find out how we're going to prevent this thing from um, really taking a toll in our area. Uh, but not only was there a hesitancy um, on our side, uh, being proactive to um, take any action, but there were hesitancy on a global stage uh, where you had organizations as big as WHO um, not saying that it's a pandemic as yet. Um, so there was a little bit of delay there, which caused us a cascading effect of different things, which happened later on. Um, and even so, uh, a number of what has maintained my hesitancy is the performance of some of these companies uh, hoard, well, companies and countries hoard, um, in some sense, operate in a in an extorted um, kind of uh, area. I don't know if that's too strong of a word. Um, hopefully, at some point, I'll be able to explain why I see that um, particular view. But also, um, if there's something to save people, you would want to try and save as much people as you can. Obviously, we live in a very capitalistic and very um, uh, a particular world. I'm, I'm, I'll phrase this quite carefully. Uh, we live in a world where obviously not everything can go out for free. And that's granted. OK, things cost money. Great. Um, however, at the biggest cost of hundreds and thousands and millions of people dying. What are you going to do to, um, how, how many will it take essentially before you actually say, you know what, um, it, it's going a little far. Let's try and see what we can do. Uh, so it, it all comes down to a number of those factors. And obviously one of the main things is that it's new. I, I personally don't know what the long-term effects are. Um, and that is usually the case, like anyone, you see something new, you're not really going to jump for it. Some people, they readily jump on it. And depending on you and what they are going for them. Uh, but those are just some of my reasons, uh, particularly why I'm just a little bit watching before I actually make any sort of solid move. Okay. And so thank you so much, Camerai. Camerai uh, is suggesting that... And I want you not to be careful with your words. I want you to speak your truth. This is a discussion and it's open for just that. Um, speaking your truth. So don't feel if you have to filter your words. There's nobody going to censor you here. But based on what I heard, your concern is the newness of the vaccine. And so a lot of people feel that way. How can you have a vaccine that literally won the FDA and the F I think and the doctors will correct me if I'm incorrect, that's the US standard of the grade line there that has not passed any of the vaccine. And there are vaccines that generally take upwards of four or five years. And so Dr. Pickering, I know that you are a strong proponent of the vaccine. How can you convince persons like Camroy who are saying this is just too new? We have not seen the side effects. You guys are asking us to just push this, some effort with us poison in our bodies and we have nothing to back up what you're saying. How do you how do you how do you answer those concerns for the young folks just like Mr. Peters? Well, good evening to everybody and thanks for having me on the panel. You know, it's the the the, the answers are most obvious. The, the answer begs itself. What more do we need to to see to be convinced? I mean, if to the discussion in a death in its own self isn't a powerful statement. I'm lost. I really don't know that I can add. In addition, what um, is Professor Cummings right? Correct. You're right. The evidence that he presented from Gibraltar also speaks volumes to exactly where Gibraltar has come from and where Gibraltar is at this point in time. And then thirdly, Professor Cummins, when he was here six weeks ago, he, he was on Honestly Speaking. And I remember distinctly him saying, he actually said it in almost a warning, the BVI 
had done well for itself, but you shouldn't let your guard down. I remember those words distinctly because they resonated with me. And I could feel it in my spirit that that's exactly what we had done. And I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. A number of my close friends have said that the BVI, and especially the younger generation, needs to pay attention to the word hubris, H-U-B-R-I-S. We had done well. We were doing well. We took it for granted, and we started to become probably filled with our own pride that we had, we had done better than most people. And now we are where we are. And I don't know that, that there's much else that we, we can add to convince anybody that the vaccine works. I mean, it's, I, 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 I find it really the difficult to put in words that there's nobody in the BBI at this point in time who, who hasn't been affected by a death. None of us, we are a small community. Every single human being in this country have been affected by some family. It is your neighbors or, or, or your friend or your coworker or, or somebody you know school with or, or, or somebody you go to church with. Every single one against the background of it all, as Dr. Van Der Poel pointed out, with, 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 with existing conditions. One. And, and, and we can stem the tide. almost open and, 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 and useless in trying to, to, to help people to really understand, you know, the importance of being vaccinated. Dr. Pickman, I understand your passion, and I'll get to you very soon, Andy. But Dr. Penn, just by looking, I hope I don't get myself in trouble, but you appear to be the youngest of the doctors this And to Camroy's point, um, and, I, and, I, and I hear Dr. Pickering's passion, but the deaths, unfortunately, don't reflect the people that look like Cameron. They look like me. Very few Cameron is not. And so the optics of it, especially for the younger people, is that I'm in good shape. I can fight this off. I don't think that young person's uh, vision goes to well, maybe I might be in, a, in good shape, but perhaps my grandmother has uh, some pre-existing conditions. So, Doc, your youthfulness perhaps may be able to insight for this. I am very fit. In my bush, and they are very focused on that. What do you say, Dr. Payne, to persons of that generation who believe that I am very fit? You guys here in the BBI have not been look like me, not me, but those people who are. Thank you very much. I, I am. I'm really torn to some extent by the, the who have a view different than mine. But I understand, I can understand where they're coming from. The challenge that I am having is that forces are asking you to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. You cannot ignore what they're asking. And we should not ignore that they want to know what the ingredients are. Are these ingredients going to cause long-term problems? If you have enough faith in between Dr. Pickering and, and Dr. Vanderpool, they have more years of, of practice than Roy has. And it's so liberal that we forget 
the way that our culture is. Somebody's going to vouch for you. Physicians in the BVI have vowed, listen, this is not going to cause you any distress, any challenge, any medical upset. I think one of the things that uh, a lot of the, the young men are asking is that, am I going to become sterile? If you tell a Caribbean fellow to be sterile, you know he's not taking that medication. And that is pouted all over the internet. Young person that is not that is not a possibility at all. So I would simply want to, to, to say to Mr. Camroy, please reconsider. But I'm, I'm happy that you're brave enough to, to come and represent that position. And I have to applaud that, okay? But at the end of the day, I hope that you take a nugget from this. Between uh, my two seniors, Dr. V and Dr. Dr. P, um, we can't do it anymore. My mouth is dry going around this island, preaching, dry. And now my heart is broken. So we have to go on here, okay? Just on the tide. Apparently COVID does something very interesting to the human body. And my system, multi-system disorders, that is one of my fascinations, lupus and, 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 and cancer, et cetera. Doing well, but this is how this condition is. Don't look at your health now, as my colleague. She said every morning it felt like somebody hit her with a bus. The next morning again, another bus. I am, I can only plead. That is something that is, it, it scares me just to see person go through that type of, of challenge. So I would hope that, um, that we can, we can help to convince our own people not to, not to play with that fire. So thank you very much, Dr. Penn. And Cameron, are you going to be, I think the start of the evening because there were so many people that share your views and again they're not brave enough to be able to say this this is my view and then i have and we're not taking quite calls yet i'm going to get to you right now andy on a positive note at least as far as the vaccination stands but you have you have some fans already blown up my phone and somebody says to me um you know camera believes that this outbreak i don't know if you have your lawyers here um is, is spread and removing the testing and the quarantine for vaccination arrivals. Mr. Cummings, I'll let you get to that, but what that suggests, though, is that um, we expect that the BVI would live in a bubble. Had we kept the borders closed, and we'll talk about in the way, this is not a government show, so we can say pretty much whatever we need to say here. Um, we will talk about opening the border the way it was done and if it should have been done a little different but realistically mr coming um can we can we um blame this outbreak for lack of a better word on the opening of the borders how can we how could we have that covid better for the residents and i apologize i'm getting some um some messages saying that the internet is not great. Um, let us know if, you're, if, if you can hear us, yes or no. Um, go ahead, uh, Mr. Cumming. Thank you. So I think it's impossible to say where we can track this back to. Neighbouring Anguilla about seven or eight weeks ago had one person who returned back to Anguilla not knowing that he was carrying the virus, and that resulted in 120 people catching the virus from him and putting three people, including two younger people, in intensive care in hospital in Anguilla. So it only takes one person to bring this virus back into a community. And I think it's impossible to say whether that is, is linked to changes in the borders or not. It may be, it, it may not be. Going back to last year and perhaps the first 12 months of the global COVID pandemic, I think two things happened here in the Virgin Islands. The first of those 
was we saw the results of some good planning, and that's planning by the government and the Ministry of Health and the healthcare system in terms of becoming ready, having testing systems uh, established, but also making sure that PPE was available, also making sure that the messaging was out there for people to know and understand social distancing, hand hygiene, etc. But you also had a good dose of luck here in, in the Virgin Islands. And there are many other small communities such as these islands that didn't have that same degree of luck, brought the virus in, and it spread through very, very quickly. Now, our intention that we're in at the moment do an extra weapon in our armory now, which is the vaccine. And people are asking about whether or not the vaccine is safe. Well, let, let me be absolutely honest with regards to the AstraZeneca vaccine. We've given 34 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine in the UK, and 32 people have passed away, believed to be linked to the vaccine. So I can't stand here and say 100% this is totally safe but nothing is ever totally safe. In healthcare, we often change one risk for another. If I were to have appendicitis, I wouldn't think twice about going to the hospital and having an operation to re remove my appendix. There's a risk in the anesthetic, there's a risk in the surgery, but those risks are so much lower than the risk of a ruptured appendix and dying from the ravaging infection that would result as a result of that. But we don't think twice about that. And vaccination is just the same. Yes, there is a tiny risk associated with this vaccine, but the risk of dying from COVID, of being seriously ill from COVID, or something I suspect we may come on to later, suffering from the symptoms of long COVID are so much, more wor so much worse than any of the more minor symptoms that may come as a result of the vaccine. Well, what I want to say is, um, I'm getting so many WhatsApp and so many texts. I'm trying to keep everything together. We, we want to make sure we, we stress. And doctors, um, I'm going to be very, very, very straightforward. You guys are getting battered um, in my feed. And that speaks to exactly that younger group that something is happening that we're not getting through. So I'm going to switch coins a little bit and ask Andy. Andy Jeffers, who is a social media superstar here in the BVI, you were an anti-vaxxer. I want you to tell us um, in, a, in a very quick scenario, I'm seeing that they're commenting and the internet is giving us a little bit of trouble. I'm hearing fine. So hopefully we will get that sorted out. All of the providers have been sponsoring it. So all of the providers, ramp up your bandwidth so we can get through this next hour, please. Andy, give us some hope. What was the period when you decided to take the vaccine and how in your mind, you literally have two minutes to answer, <laughs> did the vaccine help you to recover? Because you had a pretty bad case of COVID. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, first and foremost, I have to say my thoughts and prayers and condolences goes out to all the families and friends who have lost someone due to COVID-19. Um, for me, I was a bit hesitant at first in taking the vaccine because I didn't feel like I had enough information on the vaccine. But in the back of my head, it was not just about me. I had to think about everybody around me. And I have moved in with my mother since the lockdown started in 2020. So I had to think about my mother as well. And for me, um, I took the vaccine because I just thought that I don't know what would happen to me if I caught the virus. And I was so ironic because a week after I took the second dose of the vaccine, I caught COVID. And I'm a very social person. So I was like at every party. I was at graduation. I was sailing. And I felt like, oh, my God, I have COVID. I don't know what I, where I got it from. And... I took the responsibility upon myself and I know I would have been chastised by posting it on social media to let everybody know that I got COVID and you need to get yourself tested just in case you were around me. And to be totally honest, I had a lot of negative feedback about posting about having COVID. There were persons saying that I am going to be the cause of festival not happening in the BBI 
or I should not have posted it because there was instant someone called me and told me, I need to take down, the, you should take down the post because I was around you. And because I was around you, people are calling me and telling me that um, I need to go test for, co- to, for tested for COVID. And I felt like, oh my God, so you want to stay hidden and not let anyone know. And you don't want to go and test yourself because you just want to go about your life without thinking about Affect, I mean, affecting other persons around me. So for me, when I got COVID, the first couple of days was like the worst. To be totally honest, I was sick <laughs> for the first three days. Anybody who checked on me, called me, would know. And I have to say, too, I have to give a good shout out to Miss Fire, the health department. She called me almost every other day to check on me when I was home with COVID. But I think that I did the right thing in, in regards to taking the vaccine, knowing that I am situated around my mom at the present moment, and I'm a very social person, and it would kill me to know that I didn't take the, I mean, the vaccine, and I got the virus, and I spread it to somebody, and somebody passed away who was around me because I infect that person. I, that would not sit well with me. So that was the main reason I felt like taking the vaccine, just to be responsible for those as well, not only just for me. Well, that was very nice of you, um, uh, very responsible of you. So what Andy has said in a nutshell was that... Uh, so we you know, <laughs> that he does not have, or oh, just by appearances, um, he generally would not have the, 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 the general pre-existing conditions that plague here in the BVI. That's only by appearance. It's good that you felt responsibly enough Thank God for our praying mother, that you loved your mother, you loved your friends enough to be able to take the vaccine. However, Andy is one of the few that are converted. I have persons that are, uh, and, I, and please forgive me, but uh, one is literally blowing up. We are uh, uh, intelligent and we have a right to question what is going to our bodies, how can they be frustrated? Now, Dr. Pick, Dr. Vantapool, what do you say to persons who are saying to me, and if you see my phone, I probably have about 20 messages now, I'm frustrated because I need the doctors to have patience, to tell the story, and to give it to us in a way that they're not shoving it down our throat, but speak to us as if we are a patient and you want us to survive. Do you think that young people want to be spoon fed or should we now agree that this is such a difficult sickness and a difficult must we want you to put your mic on sorry yeah thank you very much um I, I, I talk to really all my peers, I talk to family, I talk to Let them know how important this additional level of protection is. You can protect yourself by the external means. The deep, you need a... I think equally, people need to understand. I, I, I can't say because the young people seem to be very, in general, um, very reserved and resistant to taking it. Yesterday, I had one person, I was about to, to do my usual spiel of pushing hard at her. And she suddenly said, yes, I'm ready to take it. I felt almost as if I was pushing a door that had no resistance to it. And, uh, but she, I, thankfully, she took the vaccine. Uh, just look at what's happening. The people that were admitted to the local hospital were almost 100% unvaccinated people, persons who were admitted with COVID. The persons that have died, as far as I know, and I don't know each of the individuals, I don't know their medical history, but as far as I understand, all of the persons who have died have not been fully vaccinated. So here you can see the, the, the clear evidence. And then you say, well, perhaps 
at least 2% of the people that were recently affected died. 23 people died. We, we, we estimate that we had probably about 1,600 recent infections. So that's more than 2%. Mm -hmm. That's a very serious figure. And that doesn't, that's, and, and there's a higher percentage that ends up in a hospital and an ICU and so on. And then we, there's this long COVID syndrome that affects all your system. Yeah, you know, that causes blood clots in your system. The, 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 the COVID infection actually a lot of blood clotting in your system compared to the, the, the rare case of a clot with the AstraZeneca vaccine giving you as much evidence as we can to show that the vaccine is protecting us from serious um, you can still get infected with covid but you all of us vaccinated or unvaccinated you're breathing in the air your nostrils or your respiratory system the upper respiratory system says a to filter out dust, to filter out particles, to filter out viruses. And so you will get or vaccinated, but the virus more extensively into your it means the act of what were produced by getting vaccinated, and that protects you from becoming very sick in general. Okay. Well okay. A couple of people have said that they're not hearing you clearly, Keria, okay. from your end. Okay. So the, the point that, 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 that you raise about young people saying that we should be patient, I, I have no problem with that. I mean, a large part of the population of patients that I deal with uh, are young persons, pregnant women. Some of the, the more specific questions that I have to answer on a regular basis and pregnancy is the vaccine safe vaccine to become infertile if there's a younger person who have specific questions like those. I think it is in physicians, like Dr. Penn pointed out for us to, to really delve into it and do our best to help them and what the issues are from a medical point of view. It is a complete different story. I think Mr. Jeffers was on to this. When people are just adamant against the vaccine for being against the vaccine, and that's where we are. Something that you're not going long term completion. So if we as physicians seem somewhat impatient with younger persons, those are the issues that we have to con contend that are likely to affect you. And so we have a responsibility to ensure. But at the same time, all of us are willing to listen to the individuals who have specific questions that they need answered. So we, I am seeing, folks, I am seeing the million WhatsApp messages. I promise you, I am seeing all of them. We're going to try our best to get through as many questions um, we can. I'm going to appeal to all of the source providers. I don't know what can happen at this point. Um, whatever bandwidth we can have, because it doesn't appear to be just me. Most everyone, and we understand that this is shown on every single network. So um, uh, we're going to try our best. It's such an important discussion. We want you to stay on. Um, somebody asked a very important question, and any of the doctors can jump in, but I have one for camera in a few. What is the treatment being given to people when they are in intensive care. What is the protocol? Now I wanna preface that by saying, I personally want to give a huge shout out to the doctors and nurses that are dealing with the COVID uh, patients. 
they are getting battered. And we as a community have a right to our opinion, but we don't know what they are going through. And perhaps what needs to happen is to celebrate those persons who have successfully persons who unfortunately didn't make it out. But I've gotten this question about three or four times. Once you're in intensive care, protocol, what is the what is the what is the system that works in there? What do they what do we expect? If my family member is in there, what am I expecting to hear that's happening to them? Any of the doctors or even Mr. Common, if you know, I don't know. Anyone can jump in. Mr. Dr. Ventipool said I should call somebody. So Dr. Ventipool, go ahead. That would be that takes, but of course, it's a virus, so maybe the antibiotics aren't all that effective. There are, uh, we talk about, um, there are some other big name medications which I know about because I, I read about it, I have not had need to use them. Um, so, but in speaking with the doctors who are managing the patients, they seem to have, uh, the, the, I don't think we have the monoclonal antibodies as yet. I haven't heard anybody say they're using remdesivir, um, but I, I think they're, they're using the medications and the protocols that are reasonably standard for this kind of treatment. So on that same note, Dr. Ventipool, and someone suggested, I don't know, I'm not a techie person, but this is just off to get people better connection. If you're not speaking to turn off your camera, maybe that will help. I don't know that's what that, I got that suggestion. But this is for Dr. Um, Ventipool. Uh, most of us now are very vested in the U.S. Virgin Islands. We've heard from the governor. He's made some statements. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. What is that medication that the U.S. VI seems to have that says that they are saving lives that we here in the wonderful British for girls cannot get or do not have access to. Can you give us any insight on that? Pardon me? Were you speaking to me or somebody else? Yeah, I was speaking to you. I'm sorry. So I'm saying that the governor of uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands uh, made some claims to having uh, a super drug. That's my word. I can't remember the name of the drug, but he speaks to the fact that um, this drug has saved many persons' lives in the USVI that were in intensive care or very seriously uh, restricted by uh, COVID. Why do we not have those drugs? What is it that we are not getting that the US seems to have? Or are we reading into this? Okay, so we're gonna ask folks to put back on the camera then. It doesn't appear that Dr. Ventipool is hearing me. Dr. Hearing Ventipool, now. are you hearing me? I'm hearing you now, but I'm not sure that I'm the, the one to, uh, to answer that kind of technical question in terms <laughs> of the private medication. Mr. Cummins, uh, Dr. Pickering, what's on the camera? Yeah. Um, so, it's I can't answer that question, to be honest. I understand. And, and so we don't want to put anyone on the, on the spot, but we want folks to be able to ask a question. So Mr. Cummings, we're going to get some good news just now. Somebody wants to know, after we had this severe breakout, um, we're not doing the blame game as to why we had to break out. Could we have saved ourselves by immediately shutting down the country? Or is it that the virus had already had the community spread and it made no difference. Would you have recommended shutting the country down for a week or two weeks? Or at that point, you already had community spread? I, I think it's almost certain that at that point there was community spread. The issue is once the virus becomes established in an area or in a series of outbreaks and starts passing from person to person, it's very, very difficult to, to then start to, uh, to control that virus. 
So a well community spread. Um, I understand Camroy. Um, persons are very supportive of Camroy and this, and at least on my and my my channel. They're saying the doctors are talking about the long term effects of uh, long COVID, um, blood clots, perhaps um, uh, respiratory uh, issues not being able to smell and taste for a prolonged period of time. But they continue to speak to the fact that we don't know the long-term effects of the actual vaccine. So Mr. Cummins, uh, Professor Cummins, can we juggle that? How do we weigh the unknown with the known? How do you, how, how can we expect those young people who are reading and listening and inhaling everything that you are saying and all the doctors and you're talking about the long-term effects of COVID, but you're not able to speak on the long-term effects of what the vaccine may be able to give a human being. Any insight on that? Okay, so first of all, long COVID is real. I caught COVID in December of last year. Fortunately, it was a very mild uh, bouts of COVID, and obviously this is before vaccines were available. Um, I recovered after a couple of weeks. It wasn't pleasant, but I recovered after a couple of weeks. My main problem was I felt very, very tired. Uh, I lost my sense of smell. I lost my sense of taste. As I recovered, I did notice, however, that I had a reasonably significant loss of hearing in my left ear, and I also developed tinnitus, so a ringing, a permanent ringing noise in my left ear. Now, it's now six, seven months since I actually had the disease. I still have a loss of hearing. It's gone a little bit better, but it's not come back. And I still have tinnitus. And I've been told that that's probably not going to resolve itself now. And that's definitely a long COVID uh, mm -hmm. issue. Somewhere in the region of one in five to one in 20 people that have COVID will develop long COVID symptoms. And there is no correlation between how ill you are with COVID and whether or not you're likely to develop long COVID. So I had mild form of COVID, but I've actually developed long COVID. We have people that don't recover their sense of smell, that don't recover their sense of taste, that have hearing problems. We have people with early dementia symptoms where it's affecting their memory. And we have people who are suffering from chronic fatigue many, many months after having COVID, they've just no energy at all. Your example about feeling like somebody being hit by a bus, um, then that's exactly, sorry, that was uh, that was Andy's example, wasn't it, yeah. about feeling like being hit by a bus. Then there are people reporting that every day for months after months after months. So we know something about the effects of long COVID. When it comes to the vaccine, perhaps one myth that it's important to put to one side is the AstraZeneca vaccine is not new. The AstraZeneca vaccine is new in that it's a vaccine that's been developed for COVID, but it's exactly the same technology as the flu vaccine that, of course, we've had around for many, many years. Now, if we were having a conversation about the Pfizer vaccine, that is brand new technology. We've never used that technology before uh, for delivering a vaccine, but we're not. We're talking about something that's tried and, te and tested. We basically take a virus that causes the human cold. We deactivate it and we put a tiny little part of the COVID virus into that um, cold uh, virus to actually bring it in to the body. The body recognizes it as foreign and starts to fight against it. That's exactly the same as what we use for flu, although obviously with flu, instead of putting a tiny bit of the COVID virus in, we put a tiny little bit of the flu virus in. So it is tried and tested technology. It's not new, unlike, interestingly, the Pfizer vaccine. So are you saying, uh, Professor Cummings, in a very one word answer, that we can say here in the BVI that the AstraZeneca vaccine is better than the Pfizer or Moderna or Johnson & Johnson? No, it's different technology. What I can say is that over 2 billion doses of vaccines have been given worldwide, and we are not seeing huge numbers of serious side effects. We are seeing some tiny, tiny numbers, which I think we're trying to be very honest about uh, and about the consequences of that. But these vaccines are safe. Good. Question for Camroy and perhaps Andy. Someone says, I understand that we want to get the word out there, but
but it's like the more you push the greater the resistance online we are having discussions and outside in the streets there's the government ministers and megaphones sometimes it gets overwhelming especially to the young people and it does not get the desired result now we have Rodri recognize this as well but as the younger panelists on the group Camroy and andy what can and i'm not saying the government what can we do as a community that would help the younger people to get the message in a different way. What suggestions would you have, or Andy, where it's not being pushed down your throat or forced down your throat? Um, tell me, speak for those young fans, because you're going to have about five or six <laughs> proposals by the time this is done. So speak for those young people. Okay, for, I, I believe that um, educating yourself is very important and doing research on your own as well is very important. For me, I Googled everything. I went on YouTube. I followed all the news articles. And I was just trying to get an understanding about, okay, if I take the vaccine, what could possibly happen to me? And I, um, what's, well, what are the benefits by, for taking, taking the vaccine as well? For me, I would just it, like to encourage persons, as I said before, to just educate yourself. Um, sometimes you can't sit back and expect that uh, the government is going to do everything for you. Nothing is wrong with going and doing research yourself. Um, for I think that what we're doing right now in regard to having the doctors on this forum as well to better explain the reason why you should take the vaccine, it is very important as well. But we cannot force persons to take the vaccine is their human rights if they want to take the vaccine or not but we have to look and understand at what's going on especially right hand to be there with so many person passing away within a short period of time and i feel bad for all of those parents and families who have lost someone so i think it is very important on my side to say to educate yourself Google it, YouTube it, see what's best for you. And if it's not what you want at the present moment, don't turn your back on it, but continue to follow all the articles and news, continue to do all your research until you are comfortable with taking the vaccine. That's the that's best I could say. Camroy, yeah. what suggestions would you have for the folks that are pushing uh, the vaccination? What are uh, we, Rotary, government, medical professions doing that's not really identifying with the younger people? What can we do better? Uh, so what I would say is, um, firstly, from what we can see and, and from uh, doing panel discussions like this one, um, a lot of the people in my generation, I, if, if I could say that, um, we are big learners. We look to uh, absorb as much information as possible, and especially living in time we're living now. As uh, Andy pointed out, we could Google, we could YouTube, we could do whatever we want, right? Um, we, could, we have so much access to knowledge. Um, obviously, we're also susceptible to a number of false information, but one of the things is, is having the uh, officials and the people who are who have a task to look after us um, in whatever aspect that may be, whether it's a doctors, whether it's a government officials, whatever law enforcement, um, is that they try to teach uh, as opposed to using fair tactics, as opposed to um, trying to scare us into this not happening, as opposed to taking away um, perks or uh, travel restrictions. Um, threatening that we can't work if we don't take the vaccine. Ah, um, threatening. Don't like that. Y'all don't like that. All, the thing is, it's their livelihood. And a number of people who I've spoke to, um, as well as other people who I've, I've heard of, because I'm, I'm in contact with a lot of my friends uh, abroad, um, both from here and new friends in America, Canada, uh, UK, um, Australia. Uh, but the thing is that you threaten their livelihood. What options are they going to have? They're going to be like, screw it. You know what? I'm going to take it anyway, get it over with, and just carry on. Um, and a lot of people coming from that aspect, because people are using that as an avenue to force us to take the vaccine, uh, they're becoming angry at it. They're saying, you know what? I don't think so. I'm going to back off. 
I'm going to just say, you could carry on, whatever. I'm going to just wait it out. This will be over. And they start to join a group of people who are more extremists. And one of the things is, I uh, just want to let people know is, I'm not, first off, like anti-vax or anti-coronavirus vaccine, but I'm give me the right knowledge, the right information. If you make a mistake, say so. And then we can talk about, okay, so what's the right course of action? And then we can move on from there. You literally just give me goosebumps because I don't believe that anyone, at least in my presence, have uh, articulated that so clearly. Uh, this generation, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the government is hearing this. I am confident that they're looking. Uh, they don't want to be put in a box. They don't want to be put in an ultimatum. And so what you're saying, uh, camera is when you tell us that we should take this vaccine or else we don't work or take this vaccine or else we can't travel easily, it's more resistant. So the conversation needs to be happening. And something that you said that really, really um, gave me some insight is that you want the folks that are in charge to acknowledge when a mistake is made. And that is, you know, mind blowing that we never even had that discussion to say, let's just, and, and this is not, I want to make sure I say, this is not any blame game. This is a worldwide thing. Acknowledge when the mistake is making, we are very well read, bred young people and we know when there's an issue, be clear and be fair and say this happened and that perhaps wasn't the plan and let's move forward. So Cameron, thank you for articulating that. And Andy, I see you shaking your head. So it means that you agree uh, very well. So thank you so much. Another question, I got a lot of questions. Um, this I believe is a great question, Jermaine St. Rose. He's asked, and I'm gonna ask Dr. Penn if he can help me with this. How long does immunity last? How many variants are you protected against? And explain to us, this is a lot of questions, the difference with the antibodies, when persons have antibodies. So there's a lot of questions. So let me just go with the first one. How long, how long does immunity last? And how many variants are, is it a protected against, if you know that? So again, thank you, Jermaine, for that question. The, the length of time, as Professor Cummings may, may be able to chime in, but the exact length of time that antibodies remain in the system and the quality of antibodies is still, a, is still one of those things that's being um, assessed because the condition is so early. Mm. It is still being assessed. We know that we have um, good quality antibodies made from, vaccina from vaccination. We know that persons who are post-COVID have a type of a antibody that's formed that is not as long lasting. And I think that's the important thing that the distinction between being vaccinated and having a condition and having what you call forward immunity. There's another part of the question you are asking. Um, uh, the question is of the antibodies. Now we're hearing because, um, mostly in fact, because the governor of the USVI stated for you to come to our country, you have a negative PCR test or you have a positive antibody test. What does that mean? Correct. So when the governor spoke, and I think I had a conversation with some of their leadership, there's some miss, there's some things that could have been clarified a bit better um, going forward. So the actual antigen test that is done, the swabs that are done, basically tells us if they, they have discovered any of the, the viral material of the organism on your person. Now the antibody test tells us if you've had exposure to A, either COVID before and have created antibodies or B, you've been vaccinated and have created antibodies. And so once you know the antibody, um, once you know the antibody um, in that person, you know that person has the ability to fight off COVID with some reasonable uh, expectation going forward. So there will not be an issue on the health systems wherever they're going. Mm -hmm. But because you have antibodies does not mean that you cannot be infectious. And that's important. And two different things. Okay. So let me just clarify. 
So if you have the antibodies, one, it's perhaps that you were exposed to COVID and you recovered. And is it also correct that if you had the vaccine that you would also be tested positive for antibodies or just some people? Antibodies. Okay. So I want to have antibodies. Okay, good. I want to make a clarification, folks. I mean, y'all, I'm getting battered up in here. Uh, I am reading the questions that are getting sent to me. So for the persons who are sending me the question, there's a whole team to the background. Y'all look on Facebook and send some of the questions on Facebook because they're eating me alive here. So I'm only reading as they send to me. So we want to get to as much people as possible. Dr. Ventable, Grace and Mercy says, Dr. Ventable, please clarify. Did you say one can get blood clots from getting the virus? If yes, what is the difference then in getting clots from the vaccine versus getting them from the virus? Bearing in mind that the vaccinated persons can still get the virus. I mean, these viewers are ready for us today. I'm happy to answer that question. A major part of the, the complications that occur when somebody gets COVID is because COVID induces clotting that goes to your lungs, that goes to your brain, that goes to your kidneys, that goes elsewhere, your legs and all over the place. And that is part of why your, your oxygen saturation goes so low and so on. So clots are a major, major mechanism of how COVID affects your body when you're infected. The, and can leave a lot of long-term side effects. You can, they can, you can leave you with a COVID lung that is just, you can have long-term complications of lung, with, with lung disease. Now, the AstraZeneca vaccine has been, it took a while, but they found that it was associated, it is associated in a very, very tiny percentage of people with a, type of blood clot that is a little bit different to the regular blood clot. This is one where the platelets in your body get affected. And it's a very dangerous type of blood clot when it occurs. Um, and funny enough, Johnson & Johnson, which technology is fairly similar to, to the um, AstraZeneca vaccine, has also been associated with the same type of blood clot. But the frequency of it is so it's, it's relatively quite rare. The, the blood clots associated with AstraZeneca vaccine must be less than one in 300,000, maybe closer to one and half a million. Mm -hmm. Compared to when you get COVID and you get sick, these blood clots are literally there to kill you. So, oh. so they are hundredfold more likely to get serious blood clots from COVID. And maybe a thousandfold more than you're likely to get a blood clot from from. The AstraZeneca vaccine. I hope that elevates that concern. Lawrence Lasko, thank you very much, Dr. Ventipole. Lawrence Lasko says, and this is specifically for Professor Cummins. Tell us about Gibraltar, Mr. Cummins. Tell us about the outbreaks. I think you said before that Gibraltar is about 90% vaccinated. What is the new Gibraltar looking like? Are they open to the world? How are they living? Are they just happy as can be? Give us some good news. <laughs> so... Um, it's not completely back to normal, but yes, 92% of the adult population of Gibraltar have been vaccinated. They're on the green travel list, which means that people can travel to and from much more freely, particularly if you've been vaccinated. Um, there is no mask wearing other than in shops, uh, supermarkets and, and high street shops and on public transport and in the hospital all the bars and restaurants are open as normal. There's no curfew. Now, Gibraltar has seen an increase in cases over the last few weeks. They're reporting typically somewhere in the region of 20 to 30 cases a day. But there have been very few hospitalizations. And the vast majority of those cases, particularly in the vaccinated people, are really mild. As we, as we heard earlier on, Dr. Penn gave an excellent explanation in terms of how the vaccinated people may still have a bit of upper respiratory tract type infection, but it doesn't become a major systemic problem because your body has the antibodies. And that's, that's exactly what's being seen in Gibraltar. So I wouldn't want to say it's completely back to normal, but it's no, more normal than almost any other country or territory that I've traveled to during COVID. Thank you so much, Professor Cummings. Uh, Dr. Pickering, 
question. This is a twofold question. Uh, lots of pregnant women, and as we note, all over the world, COVID has not stopped people from having a ton of sex because we still have babies happening. But the question is, um, how does the vaccine affect pregnant women? Are you, as a, the, one of the leading gynecologists here in the BBI and perhaps in the entire Caribbean, are you a proponent of vaccines in pregnant women? And can a nursing mom put any of the antibodies or any of the benefits of the vaccine into her breastfeeding child? We want you to put your mic on, sorry. Sorry, let me take a second part of the question first. Certainly for pregnant, for lactating mothers, it is helpful if that person is vaccinated or if that person takes a vaccine because the antibodies that are produced in the mom does have a protective effect on the baby. So it's, it's encouraged, not a problem. With respect to pregnant women, there are two issues to it. There's no evidence to date to suggest that vaccination in pregnancy causes any problems to the, the fetus. There's, they're still evolving, but there's no evidence to, to say that it causes any problems. And in fact, what is recommended is that it is probably better to take the vaccine than not to take it because if you become sick with COVID, there's a higher risk of pregnant women developing complications, especially later in the pregnancy. And so when you weigh the benefits against the risks, it is much better to take the vaccine than to, be, to become sick with COVID, especially in the latter stages of your pregnancy. Okay, good information to know. Dr. Penn, and then Dr. Vanterpool, I want you to chime in on this. Camroy, I need your opinion as well. Um, our government has been now pushing a vaccine drive. Our own Rotary, along with all of the other Rotaries here in the BVI, have been very supportive of the vaccine drive. Uh, Jacqueline Kettle is saying, would it not be best? And I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. I'm going to add a little bit more to her question. But we did have community spread. We know for a fact that right. people mm -hmm. who have been uh, diagnosed with COVID and perhaps some other people have not, but just stay at home, stay at home and are uh, um, asymptomatic. Would it not be prudent, um, as for Jacqueline Keo, for persons to get the COVID testing before they take the vaccine? And if you have the virus and you take the vaccine once you're actively having that virus, what are the side effects? Dr. Penn, you start, and Dr. Vanderpool, you can finish. Just Lady Carrier, we have to bear in mind that testing, if we speak about the PCR testing, and we speak about viruses as they infect the human body, there's an incubation period where you can test and get in a, a negative result. And that negative result actually is not the answer. So if you take a large amount of positive symptoms and you rush and you test them, you will get the wrong answer. So it's not as reliable very early doing that testing. So I'll yield, Dr. V, you want, to, you want the other part of the, of the sandwich or you want me to keep eating? <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as I, I'm, I'm aware, um, the vaccine is not going to make you worse if you happen to have COVID at the time. The vaccine may actually speed up your, your immune system a little bit. But remember, it takes takes time for the vaccine. From the time you get injected with the vaccine, it takes you know, at, at least two weeks to, to build up your, anti, your initial antibodies uh, after the first dose. And by the time you've had the of about four weeks after having had the first dose of the vaccine, I think I saw a study coming out of Scotland that showed that it was about 80% protective 70 to 80 percent protective against people being admitted to hospital compared to persons that did not have um, any vaccine at all. 
But when you get the second dose many weeks later, your body is now already has recognized the, uh, I'm, I'm coming back to the, the issue of the infection, but I'm just, let me just finish this part here. Your, your body has already been well prepped to receive that, to, to defend itself, so to speak, against a perceived second in, invasion by, by the vaccine, which tells it, the virus, the, the body actually thinks that the vaccine is the virus. So it comes, it goes seriously against the vaccine and creates a lot more antibodies. And so by the time a person is well vaccinated with this second dose, two weeks after the second dose, we find that you're almost 100% protected from, from, from hospitalization and death from the vaccine. So coming back as to whether getting the vaccine during an infection, is it dangerous? Well, you know, I think the, the recommendation is if you know that the person is actually actively infected, don't bother to give the vaccine just then. Let the body deal with the, deal with the virus. But if you happen to give the vaccine with a person who is infected but not, not particularly sick, there is, I don't think it does that any, any significant harm. If a person is actively infected, we re usually rec uh, recommend that the person should wait four weeks or so after the infection to get to get vaccinated. But if they get vaccinated while they have an infection, it doesn't really do them any real significant harm. I want to um, commend you doctors. I mean, some real tough questions, but understand also that the territory is hanging on to every single word that you say. So I appreciate, you know, we're putting you guys on the spot, but you're built for it. Uh, I'm going to ask a Bush question now. Um, I have never, and I'm going to get beat up because I'm probably pronouncing this incorrectly. I've never heard about very wine or a Bush that it seems to be the talk of Facebook. I see it and I know it to be a weed. I have literally seen people now on social media pointing persons to the direction of where to pick this very wine. People are selling the very wine. People are, I have one particular person that I know who are literally boiling the roots of the dot and everything and drinking everything because they feel that this very wine with a combination of other bushes. And we are from the Caribbean, so we have, we grew up on bush tea and lemongrass and all of these fancy things. And so how do you convince folks how do you convince people who grew up knowing this that the bush medicine is a good medicine not to depend on bush medicine and take this vaccine do you have any proof that this very wine that let me just say i certainly drink a couple cups of it too because i was like a car hot so how 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 could you how do you have proof that the bush the natural herbs that we have here in the bvi are not effectively helping to boost your immune system, or in some people's words, protect you against the uh, COVID-19 virus. Let me take a shot of this. Dr. Pickering, I know you can come hard. <laughs> because I think when you, when you start speaking about herbal remedies, there's no question that certainly here in the BVI, we have an abundance of knowledge with respect to particular herbs and bushes that that have medicinal effects. Mm -hmm. One that jumps out at me is the salsa bush. Yeah. Anybody who know anything, anybody know anything about the salsa bush know that there's no sedative that the doctor can give you that is better than a good dose of boiled green or, or dry salsa bush or sleep like a baby. I mean, anybody could try it and, and prove it right or, or, or wrong. Um, the the um, maiden apple bush. I know very well from the time I was growing up that the maiden apple bush was one of the best to help, according to the old people, break fever. And there's another fine bush. I don't know the particular name, but we used to call it the feely bush. Mm -hmm. My grandfather used to send me to pick that bush there that also was very good for helping your bowels. And there are any number of, of, of medicines from herbs that we know that works for for various purposes. I don't know that there's an argument against people putting forward or being proponents of using herbal medicines. Where the issue lies, um, Kyria, is that we as physicians 
we have to be mindful of what the scientific evidence shows. I can I can quote to you what I what I know from my own experience growing up, etc. But I can't push it from a scientific point of view unless there's data to back up what we do. So I don't I don't know that any of us want to get into any argument with anybody who believe that herbal medicines work. What they should do is find a way to to do the the research on what they're proposing and then eventually it can get to the point where it becomes the norm in terms of what can be used and that is a process so if people have the knowledge they should find a way to ensure that that knowledge then grows it germinates into something much bigger rather than trying to to create an issue where it is us against them because that's that's of no value to anybody at all. All right, so I should feel. Let, 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 me, let me just let me just add. Let carry on. Take your bush, ahead, but take the vaccine okay. too. Okay, I'm not, I'm not against you taking your bush, but please take the vaccine. Okay, thank you, Doc, Doc Doctor Penn. Lady Carrier, I I can tell you that um, a good number of years ago, we did mm -hmm. a project between the U.S. Virgin Islands and the BVI of documenting all of the known medicinal plants that um, I think my website, I left it at the college when I left, called bushdoctor.com. And, and bushdoctor.com, what we, what we understand from the herbal history of the Virgin Islands, though it has a good volume, we didn't have precision. We did not have precision with the particular agents. And um, nor did we understand toxicity of the particular um, herbs that were being used. So I would tell persons, the new technology that we have called vaccination is precise. So now you're gonna shoot in the dark or you're gonna shoot to the bullseye. That is the difference here. I understand. And so you know, I don't think that any of the doctors, at least based on what I understand, are, are you know, frowning upon the bush. But I think what I'm hearing is, in addition to the bush, go ahead and take your vaccine. I, I want to make sure I paraphrase that correctly. Um, Mr. Cumming, um, and Cameron, I mean, I have so many questions, guys. I promise you I'm trying to get to these questions. Mr. Cumming, this is for you. And then Cameron, I have a question for you. Um, you have said, in the matter, and we do have about 20 something minutes left to get a lot of these questions in. So we're going to ask for it to be as condensed as possible. You said that the AstraZeneca vaccine is not a new method. Uh, I have read it's one of the best, and you've said it's literally something that was uh, taken from the flu vaccine and just kind of turned up a little bit. I'm just paraphrasing really what you're saying. And so the flu vaccine has been there for decades. And so we should have a lot of confidence in the in the AstraZeneca, which is predominantly here in the British Virgin Islands. This person did not want to be um, identified, but someone is saying, if this is the case, why is it then that the government is making it possible for their residents to go to St. Thomas specifically to take whether the Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer or Moderna when it absolutely seems to be a proven fact that what we have here um, seems to be the best. Uh, what I think they're saying is that this is the reason, Cameron, this is where you come in, where persons are saying, this is why we're not, we're having trust issues because we have one hand saying we have the best vaccine and on the same token you're saying, well, go to St. Thomas and take the other one and you're facilitating that. So Mr. Cummins, please respond and then Cameron, I wanna hear your opinion on that, please. Hey, thank you. So um, I'm not familiar with with the scheme that the government has uh, in place here in, in uh, Virgin Islands. I, I only arrived today, so I can't specifically comment on that. But what I can say is that I'm familiar, very familiar with using two of the vaccines, with the Pfizer vaccine and with the AstraZeneca vaccine. I'm also familiar with a lot of the evidence about uh, how good those vaccines are in helping people develop immunity. And there's not very much to choose from between them. The AstraZeneca vaccine produces slightly better immunity in older people. The Pfizer vaccine produces slightly better immunity in younger people. But there's very little to choose between the two of them. In fact, if you look at almost all of the vaccines that are available, they all produce a remarkably good level of immunity and long-lasting immunity against this horrible virus. 
there is a slight difference in efficacy or effectiveness of the vaccine um, for the single dose vaccines. They're not as good as the two dose vaccines. And it seems that the antibodies don't last as long if you have the single dose vaccine. And there have been some suggestions that the uh, Sinovac, the vaccine made in China, doesn't precipitate quite as good an antibody response as some of the others. But in terms of the vaccines that are available here in the Virgin Islands or indeed uh, in, in neighbouring countries, then there's very little to choose from between them. And they are all remarkably effective in the job that they do. Thank you so much, Professor Cummins. Camroy, please comment on that. I think this was a young person, and that speaks to your issue in terms of the trust issues. What are you, What is your opinion there? Um, well, uh, thank you again, Carrier. Um, now, pertaining to the actual setup, um, first time I'm hearing of it, uh, and it actually raises one of the concerns I had myself regarding the, the whole um, vaccine um, solutions or options we had available, because... I realized that, okay, so um, there's the big four, Astra, uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and JJ. Uh, now, we only have one. Maybe someone, after all their research, they're more comfortable with um, the other one. Uh, now, maybe because, and I'm just speculating, but maybe because of whatever particular relationship uh, the government has with the UK, who have decided to send these vaccines down to us, it's not as easy to then acquire the other ones. So maybe making a, a solution, a temporary solution or whatever it is um, for us to then go and get it in a ne nearby country, which is right there, come back. Maybe that can appease and, and help both, both of the numbers for the people who are here. Um, now, if that's the case, that's a great initiative. It can work. Um, but then again, communicate what your thoughts are and how you're going to really try and, and uh, provide that solution. And again, if it is going to be a, a highly costly uh, solution, are there any financial situations or options available for something like that? Um, now, the other thing is uh, that I wanted to actually ask about, um, considering uh, Mr. Cummings mentioned um, that you know, they're relatively the same. The efficacy might vary. Uh, now, after doing a, a number of research um, over a period of time and just observing what countries have been doing, the vaccines in themselves has been operating in some way, um, se a sense of a travel passport. Um, you have the AstraZeneca actually not working as great in South Africa, and they just they brought in millions of doses and they decided, okay, we can't use this anymore. They pitched it out and they, they started working on something else. Uh, um, when Cummings mentioned China, the, the vaccine that they have there, uh, I think it's Sovenic. Um, I guess the community can correct me on that. Um, now, yes, it's not as great, which could be why maybe Singapore has decided that they're not going to allow um, or properly confirm that people who get that vaccine um, coming in there are fully vaccinated persons. But that whole topic now raises a whole bunch of different questions. Which ones really work? And why must this one work, but that one doesn't work in this place? And like, does this mean that we're going to have to constantly be taking these vaccines to layer up in order to be able to proceed to how we want to um, go back to normal? if that makes sense. Um, but regarding that whole situation, that's my personal view on it um, from what I've observed so far. Uh, maybe the doctors as well can shine some light on that. All right. Thank you so much, Cameron, and, and, and your opinion there. We're going to, um, again, we're going to try to get some, I know it's such a loaded topic and, and, and public. I am so happy that everyone seems to be very vested in this live. And so we want to really get many, many questions out there. Kelvin Foy says, my question, did the persons that died here last week, did they, uh, and I'm sure you can't answer it in its entirety, but he's basically saying that they died from um, underlying medical, medical conditions prior to contracting COVID-19. How can you assume that prior deaths without autopsies being done, even though other medical conditions existed? So I think what he's asking is that everyone that dies now, 
is being labeled as a death with COVID-19 when the media, the government, the doctors have said that most of these people, if not all, had pre-existing conditions. No autopsies are being done. How do we now verify that indeed, yes, these folks have passed, unfortunately, of COVID and not perhaps a pre-existing condition? This is what I believe he's asking. Dr. Pickering. Well, you know, it's a difficult question to answer because it's it's difficult to understand the question. I mean, it's it's a, a multifaceted question, and there's so many there's so many um, aspects that I I don't know that any of us can hazard even a, a go at the question. It's it's I I won't even try to to to, to do that because I I don't clearly understand what is being asked. Okay. Any other let, me, let, me, let me have an attempt because I, I, of what I understand the question to be. Um, persons who have high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, heart conditions, etc. They had their conditions there all along. They were going along not fine, but they, they were managing their, their, their situation. And then they got COVID and got start to get pretty sick with it and so they died so what i guess what we are saying persons who have these types of conditions if they get a bad infection with covid they are more likely to get very sick and die that's what they're saying so how do we how are we sure well we know that statistically the persons had their conditions and then they got covid and then they died you know, and the ones who had the same conditions who didn't get COVID didn't die at the same rate. So, so clearly, COVID aggravated the situation and, and caused them to die. That's that's how we are interpreting it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ventipol. Professor Cummings, I know that you got here today. And again, we appreciate you uh, joining us on this important discussion. But as the UK uh, ambassador for overseas territory, can you confirm is the Delta variant here in the British Virgin Islands? That has been a million dollar question and nobody seems to be able to answer that. So I, I can't, I'm afraid. I've not seen any data that suggests that, that it is, but please don't take that as a definitive answer because I've not received a line listing of all the, uh, what's called the genome sequencing of all the viruses, which is how we'd be able to, to tell what they are. Um, the simple test, even the PCR test won't confirm uh, what particular variant of the virus we're dealing with. It needs to be sent off for analysis, which uh, in the case of, of the Virgin Islands is undertaken by, by CARFA, which I believe um, they're using uh, Trinidad to, to do the analysis. So every sample would be sent off. They would do the genome analysis and receive the results back. I've not seen anything that suggests that the Delta variant is here, but equally, please don't take that as, as gospel because I'm not completely up to date. Understood, understood. Um, doctors, persons want to know, the vaccine has been pushing very heavily. If I take the vaccine, whether it's uh, AstraZeneca, whether it's Pfizer, and the, it mimics, at least that's what we think, and correct me if I'm wrong, flu-like symptoms sometimes. Is this vaccine that we're taking for COVID-19 effective against the common flu? The regular flu. Dr. Penn, you're shaking your head, saying you no. Know. Uh, Professor Cummings, saying you no. Know. So now the, the follow-up question is this. Is it safe? My both children are away in the U.S., and it seems to be a norm for you to take the flu vaccine. So is it safe now to take the flu vaccine and then take, and having already had COVID-19 vaccine? I want to hear it because people are going to be telling me, well, Mr. Cummings said so, so yes. So I want a definitive answer. Well, it's yes. been promoted. Go ahead. It, it was being promoted last year with the CDC. Uh, persons like Dr. Fauci and some were promoting that. You need to take your flu shot because if you get a combination of COVID and the flu at the same time, it could possibly be devastating. Funnily enough, because people are wearing masks, socially distancing, and 
washing their hands so much. We hardly saw any flu last year. Uh, and so so the, the, the external measures that we are taking um, uh, are uh, helpful to prevent the flu and prevent the cold, any respiratory kind of airborne transmission, transmitted uh, virus, in fact. Last year, I did take the, the, the flu shot along with my, um, I took the flu shot and I, I, I took the COVID vaccine as well. So, and I, I, I'm okay. <laughs> okay, wonderful. We, I, I wanna remind the viewers that we're winding down. We kind of have about 10 minutes and before we wind down, I want to leave each of my guests with a lasting word. So we'll take about three more questions. Um, someone asked, is it safe for someone who has embolism to take the vaccines? Dr. Pickering, this question is for you. Persons want to take it, but others told them to wait. I'm not sure who the others are, but you're suffering from embolism. You have embolism. Um, should you take the vaccine? And I think both Dr. Vanderpool and Dr. Penn are much more qualified than I to speak on that particular subject. But um, nothing that I've read to say that you shouldn't take it. Always remembering that the risks involved in getting COVID are probably a lot more than the risk of getting the vaccine. But I'll defer to Dr. Payne and Dr. Vanderbilt. All right, gentlemen, and take a take a, a jab at that. Yeah, Dr. Penn. Dr. Penn? Yes, the um a person who has when you say embolism, you mean a blood clot. That's what I mean. Is it being is is it, and you have to qualify. Is is a blood clot? Is it a recent blood clot? Was it treated before? We have to qualify these things because if you put all in the same basket, it's quite different. Yeah. Um, so if someone is on blood thinners because they had a blood clot or they've had blood clots in the past, we know that the, the challenge with, with COVID is that you're going to have dysregulation of clotting either which way. So the, the risk to benefit ratio says those patients should still um, undergo vaccination. We're not going to lump them out of the whole, the, the whole bag at all they'll be vaccinated. Okay. Dr. V? And then, like I said, the, 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 the specific type of clot that, uh, from my understanding, the specific type of clot that it has been associated with AstraZeneca is a totally different kind of clot, or at least significantly different type of clot than the regular type of thrombosis. Okay. So, so I recommend to my patients that they should still go ahead and have the, um, the, uh, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine. I've had a couple of patients who were quite anxious about taking the AstraZeneca vaccine because they have a history of recurrent clots, which I, I think it should be safe. But I said to them, well, if you're that anxious, perhaps we ought to wait and you know, get you vaccinated with the Pfizer or one of the other vaccines that doesn't have that association with clotting. It will make you feel better. Well, St. Thomas and get the well, shot. Well, Dr. V, um, I think one of the things that we need to let the public really understand is that we are actually prescribing things that actually have a, 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 thrombos a thrombosis predilection much greater than the AstraZeneca vaccine, the birth control pill. Oh, yes. Over 200 times. Yes, women getting times more likely to get a blood clot on pills. Far more likely to get thrombosis, and that's Dr. Pickering should be good with yeah. that side. And also, people getting what is uh, stuff for excessive bleeding. There are some medications that we use that have a increased cause, increased tendency to clotting, and we take it, and we don't, you don't ask any questions. You really hardly ask exactly. questions. Okay, question. We're gonna have a couple of questions soon, but. When the AstraZeneca vaccine came, Dr. Pickman, this is for you, and Professor Cummins, if you want to add to it, I'm happy to hear your voice. Um, there was, I think, a month or a six-week window taking the first shot versus the second shot. And for persons who were pro vaccines were very anxious to go ahead and get the shot. And then somewhere in between, we kind of heard uh, I don't know that a formal statement was made. If it was, I'm planning to be corrected. We're going to wait uh, 12 weeks or something to, that, something to that degree. Why was that decision made to wait longer 
versus shorter. And now it has switched roles again and said, okay, you can actually take it within a month. So that's very confusing for the viewers. It's actually confusing for me as well. Put some levity for that so that we, I see Cam White, come on now, oh boy. So get some clarity for the viewers um, because it seems to be a double message that's not quite clear. Would you like me to go first? I've lost you. Okay, I'll let, the, I'll, I'll let Professor Cummins go first and then okay. Professor Picking can understand and he'll jump in. So this is all about how science and knowledge and learning evolves as we start to use um, this particular vaccine. When the vaccine was originally developed, the recommendations were that the two doses should be given four weeks apart. At that time, there was a huge shortage of vaccine in the United Kingdom. And a decision was made by uh, a group of healthcare professionals in the United Kingdom that it was better to get one dose into as many people as possible and then go back and give a second dose sometime later than it was to give a second dose every four weeks. So the amount of vaccine that we had actually available was driving that because we could get a dose into many more people. What we then discovered was that for the people that had had the second dose of vaccine, perhaps eight weeks or 12 weeks apart, that they seem to be showing a slight improvement. Again, I'm talking tiny here, improvement in their response to the vaccine overall, as a result of which the manufacturers of the drug, AstraZeneca, looked at all the scientific data and changed their product guidance to say that the two doses should be given anywhere between four and 12 weeks apart. So the manufacturer's recommendation, if you read the literature, is that the two doses should be given between four and 12 weeks apart. What we've got is a mixture of the science in terms of what's the best use of the vaccine coming up with how can we get as many people as possible as protected as possible. The situation in the Virgin Islands at the moment is that we have plenty of vaccine. We don't have a shortage of vaccine. Therefore, what we want to do is to get the two doses into people as close to four to six weeks apart as we can to make sure that as many people as possible are fully protected. If we were short of vaccine, we may well push that timeline out further. Okay. Dr. Pickin, I know I'm, sure, I'm not sure if you heard it, but do you want to comment on that any further? We're going to ask you to put your mic on. Sorry. It was just a policy decision based on what Professor Cummins is saying, based on the data that became available. That's all. Okay. okay, so um, I, I just want to um, be an advocate for the viewers because I know some of the questions seem to be very simple for perhaps the doctors or the professionals, but given the fact that this is so new to everyone, I appreciate that persons have, I see you Dr. Pickering, um, Dr. Penn, sorry, I appreciate that persons have what would be in further simple questions um, for doctors or, or professionals to be very valid for them. So I appreciate that clear explanation. Dr. Penn, you need to add something to that? I just wanted to, to get um, Kamroy's opinion. Um, we have vaccine access in the jurisdiction and young persons have free access. If there was a cost associated, what do you think the arguments would have been um, in the jurisdiction? Would, it, would you have valued it differently if there was a cost associated with vaccinating? Uh, no, uh, I wouldn't see, um, whether it was $20 or $60, still a vaccine is still going to be something that affects my health. Um, it's still something that came on, um, quite, uh, well, not immediate, but quite shortly after the whole situation happened. So it was a in response situation thing. Um, so yeah, I would I would have still had a lot of the same sentiments, especially if everything had happened the same way, but the only thing was it had a cause. At some point, people will find the money to take care of their health. Um, so it wouldn't be a situation of um, my view changing depending on the cost of it. Well, we're gonna wrap up uh, and have this one last question and then I wanna get a one minute statement from each of my awesome panel. Um, we've heard about so many things 
why you can take the vaccine. Yet the narrative everywhere worldwide is please see your doctor if you have concerns before taking the vaccine. Can I have from one of the medical professions any one pre-existing condition that you can have, that you will have, or if you have, sorry, that you absolutely cannot take the vaccine? I've heard nothing so far from any of the medical professions say in any instance where you can't. So is there any particular thing, sickness, health issue where you absolutely cannot have the vaccine? Lady Carrier, yes, Lady sir. Carrier, let me tell you. So very allergy to ingredients. That is that is uh -huh. where it, the line is drawn. Uh -huh. um, but even, and I'll tell you, even when persons um, think they have a severe allergy, we use the old techniques where we come and give what we call a test dose. We test it onto your skin to see if the skin reacts. It doesn't react. You get the vaccine. And you move on anymore. He said severe allergy reaction. And I never even thought on that, but and I and I appreciate that. So, gentlemen, next time I'm getting it in my inbox. We need to have some females there. I promise you we'll do that next time. But I want to give each of my guests a chance, literally, to have 30 seconds to speak to the populace about this vaccine, about the COVID-19, and a takeaway. I'll start with Professor Cummings, please. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I'd like to make three quick points. The first of those is with regard to fertility that's come up a few times tonight, and I'm not sure if we properly addressed that question. It's almost 12 months now since the large trials of the AstraZeneca vaccine were actually running. And 12 months on, with many, many millions of people being vaccinated, there has been absolutely no difference in either male or female fertility in people who've been vaccinated as opposed to people who've been vaccinated. There is no change in fertility in real life 12 months after we first started, almost 12 months after we first started giving this vaccine. The second point I want to make is that this is a new virus. Our bodies have never seen this virus before. We have no natural immunity to this virus. There are only two ways in which our body can develop immunity. The first is to be exposed to the virus, which I really, really would not recommend. It's a very high risk strategy in terms of the risk associated with COVID itself, but also the risk with long COVID and the risk to more vulnerable members of the population that you could pass it on to. The only other way you can develop immunity is by being vaccinated. Eating healthily is important. Living healthily is important that they cannot give you immunity to this virus. If you want immunity, you need to be vaccinated. And the final point is, um, I don't expect anybody listening or watching tonight to believe me. You don't know me, you don't know who I am. I've arrived here yesterday on an aircraft from the United Kingdom. So why should you believe me? But what I would encourage you to do is to believe your local doctors, your highly trained, highly respected, highly regarded members of your community. I understand that almost 100% of doctors in these Virgin Islands have been vaccinated. To me, that speaks for itself. So don't believe me, believe the people who are doing the very best for this community, who are part of your community, almost all of whom have chosen to be vaccinated themselves. Thank you so much, Professor Cummins. Dr. Pickering, I'll ask you next to give me your 30 second final words. I want your mic to be on, sorry. Thanks for inviting me and, and I'm happy to continue to do my best to help to encourage persons to become vaccinated because it is our most potent weapon against this deadly, deadly virus. And to say that I have learned tremendous amount from both Mr. Jeffers and Mr. Cameron in terms of the level of thinking that exists amongst the younger population, quite willing to engage them at any point in time and to answer questions that, that I might be able to answer. So thanks again. And from the bottom of my being, please do your best and get vaccinated. Thank you so much, Dr. Kedrick Pickering. Dr. Heskett Vanterpool. Thanks to all the listening um, public that 
I just want to say that I have been a doctor in this community for uh, 36 years. I've been a doctor for the last 40 something years. And uh, I have seen many serious um, infections, epidemics, but vaccines have generally been the way to bring those epidemics and pandemics under control and to really, in some ways, eradicate from the earth several diseases in the past that wreaked havoc on people before. We had smallpox, we have polio is almost gone. Um, we have a number of other conditions. You've been taking vaccines all your life. You, you really didn't know what kind of studies went into those. No, but there was no social media in those days. People took them. If we had social media 50 years ago, polio, would, many of you would not be paralyzed right now because you, you, you would not have taken the vaccine. Please, persons, my family has taken the vaccine. Um, I have taken the vaccine. I encourage, I'm talking about my close family. I have some other family members that haven't taken the vaccine. Um, but please, if social media wasn't so prevalent, we would have all, as, as, as we did in the past, believed our local doctors, believe in, in the science, and we would have gotten vaccinated in droves and we would have already more or less brought this condition under control. So please go Thank ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Heskett Vanderpool. Mr. Camroy Peters, give us your 30 seconds. All right, so on my last 30 seconds, um, just want to say that um, I definitely advocate for people to um, take their health seriously, uh, to also, um, if you are going to uh, take the vaccine, um, do a full physical body health checkup to make sure if you're unaware of whatever underlying conditions you might have, um, so then you know exactly what you might need to do before you take it. Um, or whether or not you're just going to be fine, and then you can go ahead and take it um, to add that extra layer um, if you so wish. Um, but then even more so um, to the community regarding um, the vilifying, the blaming, the shaming um, on both ends from vaxxers saying you got to take it or whatever it is, um, or unvaxxers um, deciding that, you know, you're going to turn into a lizard, like just completely stop that. Um, that's not what we need. That only creates more division in a world that's already divided. Uh, we just need to focus on trying to teach each other and get each other to a better spot. So Very well said, uh, Camroy Peters, uh, the newly converted and Andy Antonio Jeffords. Let's hear from you, sir. I would just like to say thank you for inviting me on this forum. It's very educational and I learned a lot. I'd just like to encourage persons to take the vaccine to protect yourself and persons around you as well. And to continue to follow the COVID protocol, social distance, hand sanitize, and stay six feet apart. So wear your mask and protect yourself. So thank you for having me. Thank you, sir. Andy, and last but by certainly no means least, Dr. Mitchell E. Penn. Thank you very much for the opportunity this evening. I think that I, I, it would be remiss of me if I leave here and not tell you guys exactly why I vaccinated. Because there's a segment of this population that has no chance of being vaccinated. That those persons who are under 18, there's no vaccine for them. So as adults, we have a responsibility not to be a host to transmit to these persons. My little son is 10 years old. And I always tell the fellows, you say that you will take a shot to protect your family. Well, this is the opportunity to take that shot. It's called a shot in the arm. Protect your family. Do your best not to transmit inside of your household. And, and that's all that we, is, we're asking you to do. Be responsible. Be responsible. This is your chance to basically help us to preserve the way of life that we have. And, um, and, and trust the world and the science that, that exists. That's all we can do is ask. Thank you very much for having me.
I hear the compassion in your voice, Dr. Penn, and I thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, I am here representing the Rotary Club of Tortola, and it has been an immense pleasure to speak to these six amazing gentlemen and their various backgrounds and their various opinions. This disease, this pandemic is bigger than all of us. And from the Rotary Club of Tortola, we wanted to make a difference. We wanted to have a conversation. And as Camroy Peter so well said, we, our agenda was never to have the blame game. So I hope that the listeners appreciate the dialogue, the conversation, the respect of all the views. And it would be remiss of me if I never acknowledge, if I did not sorry, acknowledge um, those that have passed, those families that are deeply hurting, we here in the community hurt with you. And we want to express our complete and full condolences. And we pray, and we pray, and we pray that we have an end to this pandemic sooner than later. We have heard all of the facts. We've asked as much questions as we can. And I will speak for everyone on this panel and say, if you see them on the street and you have a question that perhaps you were not able to get to or something that you thought on, these are great people. Ask them. We tried our best to get to as many questions as possible. And BVI and the community and the world, we appreciate this platform. And of course, last but not least, uh, I want to thank all of the sponsors. This has been an awesome platform. And for the first time in the history of the BVI, we've had all of the telecoms agencies get together for the good. Um, so we want to thank Flow. We want to thank Digicel. We want to thank 284 Media. We want to thank... Uh, JTV Live, also ZBVI and Z King. We're honored. We're feeling really good about the love and support from the community. God bless you all. Stay safe. Wear your mask. Stay six feet apart. Let's change the narrative, BVI. We can turn this thing around. God bless you all and have a wonderful and productive rest of the week.